morning. Welcome this morning to Tri-City Baptist Church. And for those of you who are able to join us online, we welcome you on this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, it reminds me and, 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 and actually makes me think when I see snow like this, how pure and white it is, those garments of righteousness that the Lord has given us and we look forward to with time with him forever and, and days to come. But during this time, we want to worship our Lord, and I thank you for taking time out on this Lord's Day to be with us this morning. Let me highlight a few of the announcements. We have a heart class for those of you who may want to learn more about this ministry and more, and have opportunity to meet the various pastors and our chairman and deacons throughout the uh, year, throughout this semester. We meet and uh, the pastor study just behind the auditorium here at 9.30. So if you're interested in that, we would welcome you to join that class. Let me just make mention, especially for our church family, we've been really blessed with the uh, food bank every other week uh, for our community. But every off week on a Monday is for the church family. So I'd encourage you to come by. We always have a tremendous selection of food and a number of volunteers that work very hard and diligently on Monday for our church family. So do take advantage of that. Let me just make mention for uh, those of you that may have lost family members or know of others that may have lost family members uh, in these past few months. Uh, we have a program called Grief Share, a ministry called Grief Share. That is actually going to begin next Sunday evening at 6 p.m. And uh, I believe we're looking at using the pastor study again behind the auditorium for that, depending on the number of folks. We have other options as well. Uh, but it is a, as it says here, from morning to joy. And uh, so it is a group of folks who have gone through the same type of loss and, the, and then a pertinent study to keep us focused on our Lord and keep joy in our lives. If you have an interest in helping us with our Sunday school, uh, we try to track our attendance, keep track of uh, some administrative things going on there. We'd love to have someone volunteer for that. So there's information at the Welcome Center. Please feel free to talk to me or Debbie Fleming, and we can fill you in on uh, what we desire there. So let me uh, mention our missionaries of the week, Josh and Rebecca Miller. Uh, now, I don't know Rebecca as well, but I know Josh Miller from when he was just a little peewee. Uh, we were in the same church. Uh, his father and mother had been here and taught in uh, seminars in the past. His father's a doctor. But Josh and Rebecca Miller have been serving faithfully for a number of years at Valley of Grace Church in Utah. And so let me just highlight a few of the things. There we go. Uh, you'll see here uh, the praises. Members at Grace Church are demonstrating wonderful unity in spite of difficulties. Of course, they're facing the same things that we're facing with uh, having many folks on Zoom, and, and yet they're able to have a number of folks in attendance. In fact, they shared that uh, they're averaging about 60 in person and on Zoom each week. So we pray for that ministry there as they work diligently to share the gospel in uh, Mormon country. The church continues to grow spiritually and numerically in spite of COVID restrictions. We're seeing those same things here and uh, we praise the Lord for it. Let me just share a couple of things. Uh, uh, they have grace groups, small groups that they have studying, and uh, Josh has been leading that. They've been able to work through First and Second John uh, this year. And then John has also been preaching through David's life. He was able to complete that study from the book of Psalms. They also have an intern, Andrew Stevens at Appalachian Bible College. Pray for him. He's graduating uh, this spring. And I believe they'd love to have him come back and, and serve in ministry there. Do pray for the family, though. Uh, Rebecca has, for many years, uh, suffered with a variety of health issues. She homeschools uh, their son, Elliot, 
Uh, so do pray for her. She's able to keep in touch primarily through Zoom due to health issues with the church family, but just pray for them and in this ministry. And again, as their uh, intern Andrew returns to college and graduates this spring, please pray for him. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time as we prepare to open uh, this service. Father, it is such a blessing to be in your house. It's such a blessing to be able to fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ and come together in unity of heart and mind to worship you, to lift high your holy name, to extol it, and to give you praise. And Father, we come here now humbly, and we ask that you would open our hearts and prepare us this day for what you have for us. Your word is truth. Your word is powerful, and may it work in our hearts and lives even this day. May we see a spiritual change from it. Bless us now as we enter in this time of singing and prayer. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Skip. Wonderful to see everybody today. It's going to be a beautiful day. I think when it all shakes out, the roads should melt shortly and uh, the sun is shining. And uh, I'm excited to be praising the Lord together with you this morning. Let's take our hymnals and turn to a hymn, a praise to the King. Rejoice, the Lord is King, hymn 43. Let's stand together as we sing, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. Jesus the Savior reigns, the God of truth and love. When he had purged our saints, he took his seat above. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice. How can I say, rejoice, his King? cannot fail. He rules o'er earth and hell. The keys of death and hell are to our Jesus give. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, lift up your voice, I say rejoice, rejoice in glorious home, our Lord the judge shall come, and take his servants up to their eternal home. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, I say. Beautiful mission hymns, I think, in our hymn book is this next one that we're singing, Here I Am, Lord. It's a combination of the beautiful story of Samuel being called by the Lord in the night to do the will of the Lord for his people, and then also the call of Isaiah, who was, uh, the Lord asked, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And so let's sing this together. I think uh, there are a number of people in here today who have already consecrated their lives and said, Lord, whatever you want, wherever you would like me to go, I'm willing. And so let's just reassert, reconsecrate ourselves as we sing. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? Here I am.
song very famous written by a man who once was a slave trader once was blind but now he sees praise god amazing grace how sweet this amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me Seated. 
This next song speaks of that wonderful truth that is through the power of the cross that we have been set free. The power of the cross. Thank you, David, for ministering to us today. Amen. Thank you, David. Great job on that message. Uh, the word is very, very powerful if you're watching in the screen as well. Thank you so much. This morning we are in um, Isaiah 56. So if you have your Bibles, please uh, forward it to the 56th chapter. Last week we took a little time off for Valentine's Day and had some fun at a song of Solomon. So we are back in the book of Isaiah. We're making some headway. Um, it's neat to see five, so five, six chapter, soon we'll be into the 60s and hopefully finishing this book. Uh, it's been a, quite a long book. Uh, there's only one longer other than Psalms, and that's Jeremiah actually, although it's 52 chapters, has more words than Isaiah. So down the road, we still have to get through, Isaiah, uh, through Jeremiah. My message this morning is the glory of the Holy One. We're in that section of the scripture, the glory of the Lord, and our text before us speaks of dumb dogs. And so recently we uh, picked up a new addition to our family, a dog. And I'm going to talk about that dumb dog in just a moment and introduce you to our, our text this morning. 
Um, let's pray, and then we'll dive into our passage here. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for a beautiful day. Thank you for the first day of the week that reminds us uh, of the greatest sequence of events that ever took place on this earth, the death of your son and his resurrection. And we come to get today gathered around that great truth that he lives. We pray that we would act like he lives. And that we pray, Lord, for just grace to be the type of follower of Christ we should be. We pray for our country. We pray for its leadership. We pray, Lord, for our state and its leadership. We pray for our, just our local community. And um, we thank you for the different challenges you've put before us as a people. And we know that you will navigate us through any, any perils, any snares, any toils. We know that you are with us. And we are going to claim that you will go with us uh, to the end of the age. And so, Lord, uh, be with us even this morning. Bless this time, we pray now. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, last night, we had a Zoom call of a handful of our church members uh, to introduce them to Kenosa. So that's our little golden uh, pyridoodle. And that's our most recent grandson. That's number six. That's Wyatt James Sen. Uh, that's Becky and Jim's uh, second child. And uh, they, they are quite a pair. So this morning, as we talk about dumb dogs, I'll talk about mine just for a moment. He's not real dumb. He's already learning some uh, pretty, pretty clever tricks. Whenever I try to correct Kenosa, he turns to the side and itches his ears. And he's basically saying, I can't hear you. I'm not listening. I didn't hear a word you say. And I'm very clever. Uh, I do reward him for doing um, different things. And now he's... Uh, going outside to do his thing, and he pretends, he fakes it, and then he comes to me for a treat. So just very clever dog. This is not a dumb dog. Um, a golden pyridoodle is first uh, a part, portion of golden retriever, um, rated as probably the friendliest of all dogs. So our dog has a little bit of that quality. A retriever retrieves, and so our dog is uh, quite naturally a retriever. The quality that really sold us on, on Kenosa is that he is a Grand Pyrenees mix. So the Grand Pyrenees uh, can get a little big, um, just, just a little bit. They are shepherd dogs, powerful work dogs. Uh, they originated, God designed them to be mountain dogs. There's a mountain range between Spain and France called the Pyrenees. And that's where this particular breed of dog is uh, traced back to. Uh, General Lafayette from France brought them to America around the American Revolutionary War. And so while uh, this is a mountain dog and uh, especially uh, guards homes and family, sheep, cattle, and so on. So it's, uh, it's neat to watch. He'll, he'll perch above me and just sit in kind of a sentinel position and he's watching, he's guarding. And if anything kind of interferes with our lives, I think he's going he's gonna to respond. And then um, to add to the golden pirret doodle is the poodle. And poodles, as you know, are elegant, very energetic, very athletic. Uh, when you see our dog Canosa run or walk, he prances just like a poodle, just kind of really showmanship, a lot of show, a lot of prance. Do you see that tail? That's the kind of tail our dog has. So there's a little bit of poodle tail in, in our golden pyridoodle. So uh, how dumb he is, I don't know. I think he's pretty intelligent. Uh, the doodles, the poodles are hypoallergenic and they're the lightest shedding breed of all the dogs. So there's a neat combination. Time will tell what kind of dog we have. This morning, we're gonna talk about dumb dogs. And I'd like to kind of transition from two weeks ago's message to today's. Uh, two weeks ago, we talked about a group of different classes of people in the Old Testament who were not permitted to worship, congregate with the people of God. There was two, three, four, five different categories that in an Old Testament economy, you, you just couldn't be a part of the worship. And then uh, Isaiah addresses those different classes of people and then says, even them will I bring to my holy mountain. So those outcasts, those who were excluded, 
They, they in the future will be brought to God's holy mountain. That would be Jerusalem and Israel. And in that setting, the millennium, uh, they would make joyful noise. They would rejoice. They would worship uh, in, in the house of the Lord, which will be certainly known as a house of prayer. And then uh, where in the Old Testament, they couldn't offer sacrifices in the millennium, they'll be able to offer memorial sacrifices pointing back to the work of Christ so that their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar where they weren't accepted, weren't even, they couldn't even approach the altar in the Old Testament. And then he concludes in this memory text, for my house should be called a house of prayer for all people, for Jews, for Gentiles, uh, for outcasts. And so it's a really beautiful, beautiful passage here that we've been memorizing. But if you don't know the context, the even them will throw you. The even them is referring back to Old Testament outcasts who will be permitted to engage in millennial worship. And so that is our context. So between the two advents of Christ, the first coming when he dies and the second coming when he reigns, that's where all the problems are. Uh, the challenges are between the cross and the millennium. And we just happen to live in that time period. And so we definitely face some challenges. And in, indeed, in the Old Testament, the Jews had some difficult times, especially when they sinned and brought uh, chastisement upon them. So we go from the millennial heights of verse 7, and then we move to verse 9, where we find out that they had some problems and God dealt with them as a people, especially when their leaders failed to lead. And so we're going to talk about uh, these dumb dogs in just a moment. But let's, let's look at our verse, first verse here. It says, all ye beasts of the field. So um, all's pretty, pretty big, all comp all comprehensive word, all, all you wild animals, you beasts of the field, come. Notice that the word, the verb here, come, is an imperative. This is a mandate. These animals are to come out of the fields. And what are they to do? They are to, to, to devour, destroy, consume, eat. Yea, if you didn't catch it the first time, all ye beasts in the forest, come out of the forest, come out of the fields, and attack and devour. So this is a pretty gruesome text. And we'll find out in a moment who he's speaking to. This is obviously figurative speech. Uh, there's a particular group in view, but it certainly draws our attention to wild animals. And we live in a, a very beautiful state. And I'd like to talk about our top 12 beasts. Our top 12 beasts. We got a, a Grand, great Pyrenees to kind of hold off, defend, deter some of these beasts that I'm going to list. So in your mind, what are the 12 beasts? If the Lord said it here to us in Colorado, all you beasts come out of the mountains and devour a certain group of people in the front range, what would come out of the mountains? What would come in, out of the fields? What would come out of the forest? So uh, let's look at these uh, different creatures that would devour. Uh, first, perhaps you wouldn't think this small, <laughs> But uh, there are some critters that can be a nuisance. Uh, the black widow may not kill you, but surely, certainly could cause some discomfort. That little guy to the right, that little tick, my, my, my middle brother, Randy, six foot, whatever, seven, big guy, powerful man, uh, had a little tick and got Lyme disease. And it just broke him down to hardly, hardly a man for, for a long time. Just that little tick. And then, of course, um, we have a few of these around. you got to be careful in your garage or in your shoes, uh, the recluse spider. So we have some of these, and they're in the fields, and they're, they're in your garages, and they're in your basements. Well, you're probably thinking of other creatures when it speaks of all the beasts coming out of the, out of the fields and out of the forest. So let's pick on some animals here. This is a beautiful cat. We have not seen many of these. This is a bobcat. Um, Pretty quick, 25, 30 miles per hour at, in, in fifth gear, top speed. Um, usually not a threat to us per se, unless you get them in a box, uh, a beautiful creature. Uh, you can have some challenges with these guys if you're not careful. You have to provoke them. Um, you've got to be stupid, but uh, those horns are real and they can, they can push around a little bit and gorge you if, if, if uh, you get, like I said, dumb. We'll get to dumb dogs in a moment, but the, these creatures here are some threats. They could come out of the fields and out of the mountains and out of the forest. 
Uh, this guy here, he lives next to us up at our cabin. So right, right smack next to us. And uh, he likes rabbits. So we'll see his particular paw print in the snow and you'll see a rabbit print and then you see the rabbit print disappear. <laughs> you can put the math together. Uh, this is a lynx. They're kind of kind of stout around the neck, a little bigger than the bobcat, uh, maybe 20 pounds, 25 pounds bigger. And they're quick, they're 50 mile per hour creatures. So if you're gonna try to outrun this guy, good luck. I've tried to outrun them uh, and I have on my motorcycle. We've seen them several times and uh, they went one way, we went the other, but a beautiful creature. And they may come out of the woods and out of the forest and out of the fields. Uh, these guys in our state, beautiful creatures. They're not aggressive. They're not gonna probably come after you unless again, uh, it's mating season, maybe some other circumstances. And those, uh, those horns are real. They can go through whatever uh, they wanna push uh, around. So they can be a threat. Imagine all these beasts coming out of the, out of the fields and out of the forest. What about this guy? Maybe not as much as a threat as he prances alone, but what about putting him in a pack? And especially in the winter months, the coyotes like to work together in packs. And if they get you surrounded, uh, they can do a lot of damage. We've heard them how. We've watched them run by us to a deer kill, uh, 35 to 43 miles per hour. And so when they start howling and saying, we've got something down, they're coming out of the woods and they're coming out of the forests and they, they will devour whatever's on the ground. This guy, they say there's not any out here. 31, 37 mile per hour creature, pretty good speed. But uh, we've seen the wolf about 400 yards from our cabin. <laughs> Beautiful wolf. We've seen two of them. So they're wolves, they're here. And... Um, they, they can be a threat. Uh, they can get pretty big. The, the male can get up to about 180 pounds. That's a, that's a lot of animal. And with those ferocious teeth, uh, they can come out and they can devour. Uh, this guy you don't think much of, perhaps. And there's a snake line where they don't live above. But down here on the front range, we only have one venomous snake in the, in the state of Colorado, and that's the guy, a, a rattlesnake. Uh, not to give parents a lot of fear, but at Camp Grace, I call the trail from the camp down to the North Laramie River Rattlesnake Trail. And uh, we've seen a lot of rattlesnakes on that trail and down below. You got to be careful. Uh, they can uh, do damage. They can devour. The next creature, they say is not out here. Uh, its nickname is the Mountain Devil. And uh, the next guy we're going to look at, this beast, he can devour. He can devour a moose. Usually the moose doesn't have many predators, but this guy, uh, very rare. Uh, my son has seen one here hunting, and I have actually seen one on my parents' farm. And a very unusual animal, and a very, very ferocious. The largest member of the weasel family, very strong, very aggressive. We would call it the wolverine, the wolverine. And uh, they can do damage. Have any of you seen the wolverine in the wild? Has anyone seen, have you seen them? Anyone seen? I, I saw him, he was about 50 yards from me, and I didn't know what it was. You don't see him. They say there's only 300 of these in the country. I think there's far more than 300. But um, imagine this beast coming out of, out of the fields and out of the forest and out of our mountains to devour. Uh, the guy that we, uh, we're looking out for perhaps the most is this guy. Uh, we were with our grandson last week. We took a day trip up to the mountains, and we were... Uh, uh, on our four-wheeler busting through a lot of snow and tracking mountain lion tracks. It was awesome. And little Bennett was a little nervous. Don't you think we should have a gun pop pop? And I said, I think with us on the four-wheeler, I think we'll be okay, but let's follow the mountain lion trails. And cats walk in a straight line. When, when you follow cats, whether they're mountain lions here or bobcats or lynx, uh, they're, they're not like this staggered footprints in the snow. They're in a straight line. So you start seeing straight line you see this guy have a little camel hump in his paw print, uh, you're, you're following a cat. And you think you're following them, they're following you. And uh, Israel's known for its lions as well. This guy, up to, up to 50 miles per hour, good luck running from him. Uh, the males weigh up to 220 pounds. So what other beasts could come out of the fields and out of the forest to devour? Uh, I've got two more here, or three more. 
Uh, you're thinking hopefully of beasts. What other beasts are there? Lions and tigers and bears. Now that brown bear, they say is not in Colorado. They say they're extinct since 1953. There are no grizzlies in Colorado. That is not true. That is not true. Uh, this guy here, is, uh, uh, my son Jim saw a grizzly just above Wellington, up in those woods, up in those hills. And so they're here. Typically we're looking at black bears. The boars can weigh up to 660 pounds. The sows maybe up to 300 pounds. If you see that guy, you play dead. If you see a black bear, you don't play dead or you will be dead. Uh, you, you fight them. How do you stop a bear like this from charging? You take away his credit card. It's very, very important. So, so this guy can do problems, wreak havoc. Uh, the last fatal attack was in 2009. So it's not like every other week someone's being killed by this guy, but they do intimidate you. Imagine these, these animals coming out of the fields and out of the forest to devour. Some say this is the most dangerous guy in the woods, runs at 30 miles per hour, put it in perspective, a horse up to 50, 55 miles per hour. So all these animals are fast. Don't try out running them. Uh, this guy weighs up to 1,200 pounds and he can do some real damage to you if he gets on top of you. And uh, they can be extremely deadly. We have the moose capital here in our state, Walden, has 600 of those moose up there roaming around. There's about 2,500 in the state. They say if a moose stops eating when you're looking at it and stares at you, you're in trouble. If it lays back its ears like a horse, that's a real bad sign. If he smacks his lips, clicks his teeth and says, yum, yum, you're toast. It's just real simple. So that guy there, they say, is very, very dangerous. And uh, we have walked by moose hunting a number of times, number of times, three, four times, uh, moose just walking, I mean, from here to the piano uh, for, from us. They don't see well, uh, they see different, different proportions, but uh, be careful of that guy. But of all the animals, the wild beasts that can devour in Colorado, there's one that I haven't addressed yet, and you all know what it is. The most ferocious of all animals, what is it? Number 12 or number one. It's the pika. The pika is the piranha of the mountains. The piranhas of the mountains, when they get in trouble, they screech like that. And pikas come from all over the mountain, hundreds and thousands of them. And they jump all over you and devour you like piranhas, the piranhas of the mountains. Uh, I, I speak as a fool. No one has died of pika attacks yet. But think of all these animals. All ye beasts of the field. All ye beasts of the field. Come. Come to devour. Yea, all ye beasts in the forest. So this is a pretty serious message. So someone must have done something pretty bad for God to command the animals to come and to devour. In the context, we've left a millennium, the heights of it, coming back in Israel's history where God said to Assyria, come, come, this, you, uh, this foreign power and devour the northern kingdom. And later, because the southern kingdom, Judah didn't learn, uh, the Lord would say again, come to devour all ye beasts in the forest, and, and they came. And as a result, Israel, or in this case, Judah, went into captivity. So the context of this paragraph starts off with, we would say, figurative language describing international threats, international, nations that have a lot of, of, of takedown power that, that leave Israel kind of vulnerable. And so in view of these hostile enemies, we now transition to the passage that deals with Israel's leadership. So how will Israel stand up against such international threats that are coming? How will America stand up to some of the international threats that we are and will face? And perhaps more pertinent and germane to our purposes this morning, how do we stand up against satanic and spiritual warfare? So let's look at this for a moment. Israel, extremely vulnerable in this context with these wild beasts coming out of the field, out of the forest to devour. Will its leadership stand up against it? Will the leadership you know, sound the trumpet? Will the watchmen from the walls cry out? You know, will they defend? Will they be ready? Will they be prepared? Will we be prepared? As we look at our, our, our national context right now, I think 
more than any other time maybe in our history is we're in a spiritual war. We're in a spiritual war. And it's manifesting itself in some really um, obscene ways. But we as individuals, as Christians, we are in a tireless and a ferocious battle against a roaring lion, a beast, who's seeking to devour. We also have this ongoing system, a world system controlled by Satan, which opposes us and our Savior in anything that pertains to holiness. And this whole system is defined by the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life, and it's a very real battle opposing everything we try to do as, as Christians. And then just our own flesh, the never-ending battle where our flesh is warring against our spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and oh, who will deliver us from the body of this death? And we know only through the Holy Spirit and by putting on the spiritual armor can we fight a good fight. And so Israel here is going to be attacked. Will they be ready? Spiritually, you're going to be attacked. Will you be ready? Notice here in the context of Israel that in view of these beasts coming to devour, you would like to think that they'd be ready for it, that their leadership would be uh, in tune and sensitive and alert. But notice just to the contrary what is said here in Isaiah 56. In Isaiah 56, verse 10, it says, his watchmen, referring to Judah, Israel, his watchmen are blind. His watchmen are blind. You know, if you've ever done guard duty, some of you have served in the military. I know, Kevin, you were military police. You're watchmen. You're on guard. It's not a time to sleep. It's a time to be alert. Uh, we have a friend. His name is Joel. Joel's a monster of a man. Marine. Uh, was doing guard duty in a little mini tower, one of the fobs there in Afghanistan. And he was up there, and he was just watching, very much alert. Came off of his duty. The next guy walked up the ladder into the watchtower and within maybe five seconds was taken out with a bullet. How do, you, how, do you, how do you get prepared for something like that? Here you have a watchman who's not looking, who's blind. I've got a, a picture there of the three blind mice, if you don't know what that is, the three blind mice. You know, I remember back in college, I was uh, playing baseball against Millersville. We, were, we had an 8-0 eight, eight lead in the eighth inning. I actually had a no-hitter going, and I told the coach, I said, Coach, I have nothing left. <laughs> I'm going to keep pitching until they get a hit or a run, and then bring me out. I have nothing left. There's no gas in the tank. And so in the eighth inning, um, I think I got an out maybe, and then, then the, it, just, it just fell apart. They, they were getting hits everywhere, and the, the, the no-hitter went, the shutout went, 8-1, 8-2, 8-3, 8-4. And the coach left me out there. And there was a play at the plate uh, to tie the game. And I thought the guy was out. My coach thought he was out. My coach was a, a good guy, maybe a Christian man. I never heard him cuss. I only saw him get angry three times, and they all related to me. And uh, on this occasion, our catcher thought he put the tag on the guy, would have given us an 8-7 lead. And um, the umpire called him safe. And I can remember the coach, our coach Wright went out there, got the home plate ump and the third and first base umps together and got in their face and called them the three blind mice. And um, that didn't go real well. And I added, I added my expletives and uh, we both exited, exited the stadium <laughs> uh, because of the three blind mice comment and my delightful additions. His watchmen are blind. You get the picture. They don't see anything. And they're all ignorant. They're, 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 just, they're ignorant. And some of you are asking the question, here we are in America, and you look at some of our leaders now, and we say, what, you know, try to interpret this, evaluate this, analyze what is going on. I think this, this sums it up. Here, Israel's leaders, they were blind. They just didn't see. They couldn't see spiritual truths. They had blinders on. You know, we have leaders today that just can't see. They don't see the cross. They don't see salvation. They don't see the Bible. They don't have a Christian worldview. They're just blind. They need, they need Christ so badly. They're just ignorant of truth. And uh, it's, it's, it's one thing to have these people on the sideline, but now today in, in spades we have people who are just blind and ignorant. 
So, so, so what do you get when you have blind leaders? You have them leading blind people. Look what Jesus said, Matthew 15, verse 14, let them alone. That's, in, that's instructive. When he came to these blind leaders, he said, leave them alone. It's almost like, why? You, you ask the question, why do you leave them alone? Because likely they're going to remain blind. Perhaps you, you go after those who, who they're influencing, that maybe they can get their eyes open and they, they will see, while others may be so hardened in their sin and unbelief. But here, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. We know that in due time, blind leaders end up in a ditch. So we must warn, leaders open your eyes, but likely they won't. But we can tell others, open your eyes to truth so you don't follow others who are blind into ditches. And so what we may be anticipating in America, what will that ditch look like? When we are being led by incompetency, would that be the ditch of an economic disaster? Will it be the ditch of an international military disaster? Will it be the ditch of a disaster of, of, of a spiritual magnitude, a health pandemic, a social whatever disaster? Only time will tell, but the blind lead people, and often they lead them into the ditch. So this is very important to grasp. Israel was threatened by some pretty ferocious enemies and their, their leaders, they were blind to it. They didn't see it. They didn't see it coming. They were dull, dense, ignorant. And then uh, the Lord compares them to three different analogies. He calls them dumb dogs. Dumb dogs. I, I was watching um, a little video clip yesterday of Helen Keller. It was really precious. Maybe somebody saw that post. Helen Keller um, would occasionally come to my, my great-grandfather's office in Philadelphia. And she would come in, and they were, he, she was friends with Gov, and she'd come in to his grand piano and put her face head up against the piano, and he would play songs. And she could feel the vibrations. She could feel the vibrations. And later she would write a book, and she sent a beautiful copy to my, grand, my great-grandfather, my uncle. My uncle has it. But the post yesterday was uh, Ann Sullivan working with Helen Keller where she could put her hand on mouth and, and throat and, and feel the, 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 the words, the syllables, the sounds. And I think maybe her first sentence that she sounded out through this process was, I am not dumb. I am not dumb. Here it says they are all dumb dogs. Referring back to those leaders, they're all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. So, so rather, you know, here's harm coming. Here comes a ferocious enemy. Here, here comes a, the mountain lion and the bear and whatever other aggressive animals and rather than warning others about the threats, <laughs> they don't bark. Some of you have dogs, and you joke about if, if a bad guy came to your house, they would be, you know, licked to death or whatever things you say that, to say they, don't, they won't alert us to anything. They're not going to help us, you know. They, they won't bark. And these leaders, they don't, they don't warn. Why? Because they are blind, because they are ignorant. They're not going to alert people. They're sleeping they're lethargic, they're lying down, and they love it. They, they, they love an activity. They, they, they don't want to lead in, in the way that the country needs. You know, you think of this. Think of our current examples, and there's so many of them, of, of current leaders in America that just don't do anything. Or if they did do something, it was, you know, horrific. You know, my folks live in New York. I've never heard them talk more about moving from the state of New York. They live in upstate New York. If you're familiar with New York State, there are two states. There's New York City, that's a state. And then there's the rest of the state that is so beautiful, you know, and pays for all the habits of the city. And uh, they're thinking about their mayor and what he, the cover-up where he sends, sends infected COVID patients 
into nursing homes with people who are not infected with the COVID, but as a result of the mix brings disease and death and then lies about it and covers it up. Today he says, oh, it was just, it was coming. That information was just on delay. No, it wasn't on delay. You got caught. You didn't warn the people. In fact, just the opposite. You, you, you made decisions that led to death. This is incompetency. This is just one example. When, when China released this Wuhan virus, how many days was it before and then when it was made known? How many days? How many people died because the world was not warned? While they slept and as they lay down, as they slumbered, there was not the warning. We have a health organization, doesn't warn. We have people that are being paid to lead and they sleep on the job. They're dumb dogs. They're dumb dogs is what they're compared to here. Notice in addition that they're not only dumb dogs, they are greedy dogs. You know, uh, I was really cute with my grandkids. They, we were at Walmart and I usually buy them some, some toy or something. And Bella said, uh, Pop, Pop, I want you to know I love you and not because you buy me toys. I said, that's great. I'm not gonna buy you a toy today. What? <laughs> so, um, greed, greed. I, I think of Kenosa. Kenosa, I hope you love me rather than just all these snacks I keep giving you. Love me, love me more than the snacks. Please love me more than the snacks. These are greedy dogs which can never have enough. So put this in context. This is very typical of leadership. They are blind. They are ignorant. They're sleeping on the job. They're not doing what they're called to do, to warn, to alert, to protect. And then what's driving their engines is often greed. Greed for power or greed for material, material things, greedy dogs. I don't know if all these people are greedy. I, I don't know their hearts. But I'll tell you what, we're all in the wrong business. If you want to have money, it, it, politics is the way to go. I tell you what, our, our Congress, is, is there anyone in that group that's not a multi, multi, multi-millionaire? And many of them weren't that when they got into office. How do they get all this money? Mark Warner from Virginia, net worth $214 million. It almost seems like if you have money, you can buy an office maybe. I think of Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, worth $114 million. $114 million. Dianne Feinstein, $87.9 million net worth. Mitch McConnell, this isn't just a Democratic issue. There's a lot of Republicans getting really rich from their political offices. McConnell, Maybe it's his wife, I don't know, but $34 million net worth today. $34 million. Liz Cheney from above us in Wyoming, a, a mere, a, a, a miserly $14 million net worth. And then how, how did the Clintons get so wealthy? How, how does a lawyer from Arkansas uh, accumulate, just one of them, $111 million? The presidency only earns $400,000 a year right now. How in the world? That's a lot of books, I guess. For 111 million in the Obamas, how in the world did, did you go from you know, a $29,000 to a $400,000 a year job to a net worth of $70 million? How do you get all this money? And the Biden's net worth and, and our own governor, our own governor, $313 million net worth. Think of, the, think of these numbers. And some of you are saying, no, this is no big deal. I've got some of that myself. Probably not. I don't think we have a $313 million um, church member. If we do, you're not tithing. I'll tell you that. You're not tithing, okay? And I don't know if any of these folks are greedy. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything about their hearts. But, but the word of God is saying there's a tendency in leadership where they take advantage of their office and they become greedy dogs. That's what I'm saying. And who, who feeds these dogs? Who feeds the dogs? You and I feed the dogs. We feed the dogs. 
So these are, are blind leaders, they're ignorant leaders, they're, they're apathetic leaders, they're not doing their job leaders, and they are greedy. Notice here, and they're shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way. The reason they don't understand, it's not America first, it's not the church first, it's not the Christian first, it's not family first. It's all about them. They all look to their own way. What can I get out of this? Rather than what can we do for our country, what can the country do for me? They're all, they all, that's pretty, that's a pretty comprehensive statement. These, these, these dumb dogs, these greedy dogs, it's all about themselves, everyone for their own gain. And, and, and maybe that's the way we all operate to a degree because of our fallen nature, but as we get sanctified by the Spirit of God, hopefully that's less and less of our life. And it's hard to see national leaders where you, you, it just doesn't make, add up why are they doing what they're doing until you realize passages like this are saying they're greedy. They're just looking out for themselves. So many would fit that category. Everyone for his own game from his, from his own quarter, from his own area, his own place, of respond, uh, place where he was appointed. So they're selfish, selfish shepherds. They don't understand. They, they're not satisfied. It's all about pleasure. It's all about their own lusts. It's all about themselves. So we have these incompetent leaders who are then described as very indulgent. And uh, th this is extremely powerful what he then says. He says, come ye, say they, I will fetch, seize, grasp, wine. And we will fill ourselves with strong drink. To fill yourself is to be addicted to it, to take it in excess. We will fill ourselves with strong drink. And strong drink is in parallel with the wine. So, so these politicians, it's all about greed. It's all about their own selves. And many of them, as you'll see, they love the party. And, and this is nothing new. When you go back to, to the founding fathers, uh, you look at their alcohol tab for that meeting in Philadelphia when they did a little bit of writing. Look at their alcohol tab. It's unbelievable amount, the amount of alcohol that these politicians historically have consumed, even in our little country and our little timeline of several hundred years. These are folks who love their wine. They love their strong drink. They love their party. And it, it's really sad. You, you think that this is a frat house. This is a sorority. This, this is, this is college pagan unsaved life where, hey, what are we going to do this Thursday night? What are you, who's going to get the keg? What, what, what are you going to pick up? Let's just party, party, party. And so for them, they're living for the now and now, and it's all about partying. Uh, some of the stakes have changed. Some of it's not wine and strong drink. Some of it's cocaine. Some of it's other uh, high, high drugs, expensive drugs. But it's the same attitude. We're going to take advantage of our office. We're going to get rich off our office. We're going to party. It's all about us. We're going to have fun. And we'll fill ourselves a strong drink. And then look at the attitude. And tomorrow we're going to do it all over again. Because life is just one big party. Boy, if a Christian has this mindset that life is one big party, you've missed the mark. If you want to find life, die. You want to find life, lose it. Then you'll find it. Die to it, and then it will it'll be alive. But for these, all they want to do is get to, it's from one party to another party. And tomorrow shall be as this day. It's just going to be another party day. And hopefully it'll be even a bigger party day and much more abundant. What a sad life, because this life ends in emptiness. They're trying to fill themselves with, with, with strong drink and partying. Some of you young folk, you're going to go off to college and you're going to be tempted to party. The, the lie is going to be there that, hey, you can find joy and satisfaction. This is really fun. This is what you need to do if you want to fit in. And, and yeah, you may fit in briefly when you're paying for the drinks. And yeah, there's a little pleasure in it, but it's only for a short season. And then you'll hit bottom. And then you'll regret it. Then you'll have things that you wish you hadn't done. But tomorrow should be as this day and much more abundant. These are indulgent losers. These are indulgent losers. Now, watch what happens. 
because technically the paragraph ends in chapter 57, verse 2. So let's look at it. There's a transition going on. We're at the millennial heights. Now these animals are, are, are commanded to come out of, the, out of the fields and the forest to attack Israel. Are you going to be ready? No, you're not ready. You're dogs that don't bark. You're blind, you're ignorant, you're greedy, you're self-indulgent, you're useless. How did it get to that point? Well, there is a transition that I think we need to pick up. And I think this will help you realize that anything we are going through as Americans today or Christians today, it's nothing new. Watch what's happening. We have a transition. Hezekiah is a really good king. Really good king. He has a, a lump, perhaps a cancerous tumor. God heals him from that, extends his life. How many years? 15 years. During those 15 years, there's a boy born. His name is Manasseh. And just as good as the reign of Hezekiah was, to the opposite pole is how wicked the next reign would be under the rulership of Manasseh. Look at this text. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign and reigned 50 and five years in Jerusalem. That's a long time. I am so glad for some term limits. I'm glad for twosies and foursies. I wish there were just sixies. This guy has no term limits. 55 years of this horrific, evil man. His mother's name was Hephzibah. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. For he built up again the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed, and he reared up altars for Baal and made a grove as did Ahab king of Israel and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord of which the Lord said, in Jerusalem will I put my name. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Are you kidding? This, let this sink in for a moment. Hezekiah worked against the grain of flesh. He worked against the grain of sin. And he built a kingdom that was really denoted by righteousness. There wasn't the idolatry. There weren't the altars for Baal. And the house of the Lord was the house of the Lord, Yahweh. And he did so much good for his country. And then in one election cycle, just one, and the guy wasn't even elected. He, he took office because he was the son of the king. And so Manasseh takes the office, and within days, weeks, maybe months, all the good that Hezekiah did was turned upside down by one, by the next political leader. Can you imagine that happening? Where you say, well, I see a country that made some progress in certain areas. And then with just the swipe of a pen in days, hours, it's all turned upside down. Can you imagine that ever happening? It's exactly what happened between Hezekiah and Manasseh. Exactly what happened. So all of a sudden you have a continuation of leaders that were blind and ignorant and apathetic and greedy and dumb. Manasseh fits those character qualities. So sad. And look at verse 6. Are you kidding? And he, Manasseh, made his own son pass through the fire. You know what that means? He sacrificed his own son to a pagan deity. Can you imagine a father or a mother or parents taking a, a child and casting that child into the fire and seeing it killed, destroyed? Can you imagine a nation that would kill innocent children? That's how bad this was. One of the hardest things for me to swallow personally right now is some of the progress we were making on the, on the topic of abortion last handful of years. Some of the judgments that were being made, some of the direction that was being made, some of the Supreme Court appointees with their views and so on. Within, within just weeks of a new administration, we now know that the Affordable Care Act will cover abortion. Roe v. Wade will be, with, will be stood behind. 
excuse me, every effort to stop state restrictions on abortion, the federal government will restore funding for Planned Parenthood, and the list goes on to endorse abortion in our own country and to fund it even outside of the borders of the United States of America. All within the sweep of a pen and the change of one leader to the next. Well, look what it says. And he made his son pass through the fire and observed times and it used enchantment. This is a cult. This is when you have people murdering children, that is so demonic. Satan is the father of murder. So when you have parents and women aborting their children, that is so against nature and God. That is so motivated and inspired and enabled by Satan and demonic activity. It's horrible. Here, with, with the murder of his son, all this occultic practices, you have familiar spirits and wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. I tell you what happens. When you have leadership like this, it gets God righteously angry. And his justice will not sleep forever. So there's a transition going on. And guess what happens when the transition takes place? I'm just telling you where we are. Look what the Bible says. You say, what's, 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 what's in store for us? <laughs> Can I encourage you? You're going to die. <laughs> you are going to perish. You and I are going to perish. The righteous perisheth. And look at the next phrase. And no man lays it to heart. No one really cares. Who cares what the Bible-believing Christian believes? Who cares about the Christian population that wants to fear and honor God? Who cares? Let them die. Good riddance. They didn't take it to heart. The righteous perish under a Manasseh, and the merciful men are taken away. Josephus writes, Josephus, first century Pharisee historian, writes about Manasseh. Listen to these words. Manasseh was so hardy as to defile the temple of God and the city and the whole country, for by setting out from a contempt of God, he barbarously slew all the righteous men that were among the Hebrews nor would he spare the prophets, for he every day slew some of them till Jerusalem was overflown with blood. This man, Manasseh, when he took power, he said, I'm not going to follow my dad. I've got an agenda. It was Satan's agenda. And part of Satan's agenda was take out the righteous. And it's likely Manasseh who kills the very prophet we're reading about. Isaiah. And Josephus says he delighted every day to take out a righteous, merciful person. Every day. I tell you what, there may come a day in America where we have such an administration that targets the church and targets the Christians. None considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. We're, we're just not stopped. No one steps in the, in the way. No one says anything. Well, for us... If this takes place, we enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds. And the beds we're talking about are not queen size or king size or twin <laughs> or bunk. The beds we're talking about, if you have the, 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 the fortunate <laughs> burial of a grave, <laughs> it's not the grave. You're going to enter into your peace. You're going to die. You're going to rest in your beds. And the little phrase here, each one walking in his uprightness, literally, he who walked in his uprightness. So those who walk uprightly, those who live godly in Christ Jesus, are seen here being persecuted to the place of even death. That's what Manasseh did. That's what Manasseh did. And you look around this world at the, at the map of persecution of Christians, we're, we're so myopic. We, we just, we're so focused on our lives in America we don't even realize that there is a persecuted church out there. Colin just sent something from uh, his friends in Myanmar and the intense persecution that is and will continue. And we've been exempt from that, but that, that, that exemption clause may be removed. We'll enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, those who walked in their uprightness. So I'm going to discourage you this morning, but this is a very real picture in history 
where Israel was under threats. Do you think we have any threats right now? It's really fascinating that the that North Koreans train their children that Americans are big-nosed wolves. Big-nosed wolves. <laughs> Ferocious animals. They're going to come out of the woods and come out of the fields, come out of the forest. We have enemies. We have some real serious enemies. Will our leadership stand or will they sleep? As Christians, we have a very, very serious foe. We have a, a roaring lion who wants to devour. But we can stand against him by the grace of God as we put the armor of God and stand in his might and his strength. We can stand and we can serve and we can still rejoice in our wonderful Savior. But it might get a little rocky. And Christians right now, I'm afraid, are a little bit soft. So I don't want to discourage you. We may never return to what we call normal. We may never return to what you think was normal. We may never return to that. And that's not to give you discouragement. I just want you to look re realistically. We may never return to normal. But I am encouraged in Christ. I am encouraged in the gospel. The gospel works, whether we're persecuted or not, whether we have the righteous in office or not. The gospel continues to be used by God. And our Savior said that the gates of hell will not prevail against Christ and his church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time together this morning. And what a pertinent passage to read and to look through that helps us understand and maybe a little bit what's going on in our country today. We know we're not Israel, but there sure are a lot of parallels in principle. Lord, help us walk in our uprightness. Help us be merciful people. Help us try to warn a few of the blind uh, to not follow blindness and stupidity and dumbness. Lord, may we uh, be a good witness. May we not stop talking about Jesus. Lord, use us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you come and lead us, please? Well, let's take our hymnals and turn to hymn 24 and really turn in our singing to the sole source of our comfort in a world that's ever changing and ever more hostile to the gospel. We have a God who has been our help in ages past and will be our hope for years to come. Let's stand together as we sing hymn 24. We'll sing the first and the second stanzas this morning. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. Before the hills in order stood, or earth received her frame. From everlasting thou art God to endless years the same. See you in Bible study.